Hello and welcome back to Curbside Ethics. I'm Stephen, your host. I am an anesthesiologist and clinical medical ethicist. Let's talk about COVID-19 vaccination and transplants. So we've seen over the last couple of years with the COVID-19 pandemic, medical ethics, and just the political environment, a lot of things that ordinarily would not be super controversial have been much, much more controversial than normal. Every year, there's a couple of folks in the minority that, you know, refuse flu vaccines for whatever reason. But obviously, this COVID-19 vaccine has castigated the population and divided us into camps, mostly lining up with political parties. Let's take a look, though, specifically about the ethics behind COVID-19 vaccination and how they relate to being listed for transplant. Essentially, this boils down to a group out of Loyola. They looked in, at the literature surrounding organ transplants and the current requirements to be listed for transplants and ended up making two recommendations. Recommendation one is requiring vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of being listed to receive a solid organ transplant is ethically justified by the principles of sound clinical medical ethics. Recommendation two is that requiring vaccination against COVID-19 of the patient's primary support person and eligible members of the recipient's household is consistent with current requirements of these roles. The information for this episode comes from the article, Putting Ethics and Clinical Decision-Making Before Politics, Requiring COVID-19 Immunization for Solid Organ Transplant Candidates and Their Support Team. This is available in the October edition of the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. This public health crisis has become so politicized that, again, a lot of these simple measures that we use to decrease the spread and effects of communicable diseases are now considered controversial. Even for people that work with at-risk populations in nursing homes or in schools or in hospitals with immunocompromised patients or in the public work sector with police officers, among other people, that are choosing to go with party lines and debating and refusing this vaccination. When we look at the duties and the established practices and roles of healthcare workers and public safety professionals, though, it's pretty obvious and clear that we should expect the practice of vaccination to be pretty much universal amongst these groups. Vaccination protects not only these professionals, but also those groups that they have committed to serve. Vaccination against COVID-19 should not be controversial when focused strictly on the established frameworks and practices that surround being eligible to be listed for the wait list of organ transplants. This paper, it looks through different frameworks and practices that are already established to dispel these myths and this quote-unquote controversy surrounding COVID-19 vaccination being best practice for potential organ transplant patients. When it comes to the ethical framework involved, deciding to list a patient for organ transplant isn't very difficult or isn't very different, rather, from a lot of other clinical decision makings. We still have to take the patient and explain the risk and benefits. Patients still remain autonomous. They're able to make decisions, and it's our job as clinicians to prevent to help them make a full, informed decision weighing the risk benefits of transplant, looking at their illness and the options for treatment. Patients can refuse or consent to this organ transplant. However, on the other side, we know that organs are a scarce resource, a life-saving commodity, and it is one of the most precious gifts that one patient can give to another. With great power comes great responsibility. There is increased responsibility on the transplant team to be good stewards of this precious gift. And this plays into that shared decision-making process. When we're having these these shared decision-making processes in clinical medicine, we have each party that brings their expertise to the dialogue, and we sit down and have these conversations. Patients know their lives. They know what they value. They know their history. They know their families and support systems. Physicians and other healthcare professionals understand the treatment options. We know the general benefits, the stressors, the risks involved with whatever the treatment is, in this case, organ transplant. We offer options to the patients that ideally 
give them benefit. When it comes to making decisions regarding solid organ transplantation, there is somewhat of a higher standard than just providing some chance of benefit. Again, as stewards of this precious gift of this organ, the transplant team is committed to ensuring that the transfer process, the recovery period is optimized to increase the odds of the patient receiving benefit from this precious, precious gift. The transplant team uses their expertise and their screening protocols to ensure the highest chance of success for patients receiving these organs. A lot of these uh, requirements are well known. Um, Patients that are going for liver transplants that may have suffered from alcohol, substance use disorder, they have to abstain, go through a treatment program, ideally um, not have that uh, addiction anymore. You can't smoke cigarettes and be listed for lung transplants. I think the same for heart transplants as well. These requirements seem like common sense and typically are not extremely controversial. Additionally, what we have to think about is the ethical principle of non-maleficent and doing no harm. Physicians, sometimes we do harm patients in order to obtain the maximal benefit. Surgery, for example, you're going to harm the patient, but the end result, ideally something good and better for the patient. Obviously, with transplant, there's going to be an operation. It's going to be a medical procedure. There's going to be a healing process. The one thing that is pretty distinct about transplants is that the patients are going to be immunosuppressed after that transplant. There's medications that are used to decrease the risk of that newly grafted organ being rejected by the body, being recognized as a foreign entity and being attacked. So we uh, suppress the patient's immune system to, to prevent that from happening. Before undergoing a transplant, because we know patients are going to be immunosuppressed, a lot of programs require that patients be up to date on their vaccinations, including hepatitis A, B, receive a seasonal flu vaccine, etc. These vaccines are shown to be efficacious against different infections, and this increases the likelihood of success with the transplant, or at least decreases some of the, the bad things that can happen. In addition to the vaccination status, organ transplant programs also look at the social support networks for patients that are going to be listed for transplant. The support team and the patient's household and close contacts, they have to meet certain qualifications that correlate with successful outcomes. For example, a potential lung transplant candidate can be ruled ineligible to be listed if their primary in-home support person is a tobacco user or smoker specifically. While this may go against our tendency as Americans to be individuals, it follows with this healthcare team's duty of stewardship of this precious resource and not doing harm to the patient. The Clinical Ethics Consultation Service at Loyola University was asked to analyze the ethical issues involved in requiring vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of waitlist activation for solid organ transplantation. Their first recommendation, again, was to require vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of being listed to receive a solid organ transplant. This requirement is ethically justified by the principles of sound clinical medical ethics. This uh, is all very on brand for everything else that goes with receiving and being listed for a transplant. This recommendation is supported by beneficence. You know, we want to do good for the patient. This is what is best for a patient that's going to be immunosuppressed. We know that they're going to be at risk for communicable diseases. Additionally, after receiving a transplant and being on immunosuppressant medications, it's less likely that they will receive good immunity from a vaccine that's administered after the fact. Additionally, this requirement of vaccination is consistent with other requirements to which transplant candidates have to agree in order to increase the opportunity for a successful outcome. So this respects that integrity of the shared decision-making process and the fundamental medical ethical principles. The second recommendation was that requiring vaccination against COVID-19 of the patient's primary support person and eligible members of the recipient's household is consistent with recurrent or with current recommendations and requirements for those roles. The eligibility of patients for listing is currently dependent on the willingness of these people to meet significantly more difficult and more strenuous requirements, such as the primary support person of a lung transplant patient not being an active smoker. 
This requirement is consistent with that current standard of care and respects the integrity of the shared decision-making process. This requirement conclusion is more provisional in nature and is strongest in the time of an ongoing pandemic. When we look at the last two years of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's been devastating worldwide. We're at the point where there's over 700,000 fatalities in the United States alone. The pandemic has had an, an worse effect on patients that have comorbidities, patients that are immunocompromised. Among these are patients that are recipients of organs, organ transplants. Requiring that patients going on the list for transplant be vaccinated is, is consistent with that well-developed uh, guidelines of the transplantation programs. They go on to state in this article that, you know, these requirements should be reevaluated. They give an example back in 2008, 2009 flu season where they did not require the flu vaccine for solid organ transplant candidates because it was not believed to be effective that year against that strain of the flu. However, as the vaccines advanced and became better for, you know, depending on the season, the protocols were updated to continue requiring this, this flu vaccine. They recommend that if this COVID-19 pandemic comes under control in subsequent years, with the risk of community transmission being lowered to insignificant levels, perhaps transplant programs should consider whether the requirements of the patient's household should be continued or would it just be a simple recommendation that household and support system folks be vaccinated. This ongoing reassessment of this requirement is to maintain good faith and it keeps in requirements and in line with the stewardship and utility standards of other requirements for a patient's household. They circle back around to bring up the point again that this policy is unlikely to be controversial except for the current inflamed and politicized state of public affairs. The COVID-19 vaccines are highly effective and present few likely burdens to recipients besides a short-term discomfort. Their utilization is recommended from both a medical and public health perspective. However, as a current debate has been distorted by misinformation and partisan politics, some strongly continue to resist vaccination. This distortion by politics, however, should not be allowed to override the long-established ethical standards of patient care. I thought this was a very well-written article. Again, it references evidence from that world you know the social media post about transplant patients have to get COVID-19 vaccines they were written you know to, to grab attention to be inflammatory and I think they only tell half the story now you got folks that don't know anything about medicine and they're complaining about oh you have to be vaccinated to get a transplant they're turning transplant patients away yes absolutely if you dig deep into the literature you see that there is ample precedent for this to be done there is strict guidelines, and if you think that's something that should be changed, you know, it's up to you to do the research, parlay with the transplant teams, the transplant networks. You know, these folks dedicate their entire lives and, and years and years of training to be able to help facilitate this gift of life to patients in need, and they honestly just want what's best for the patient. So I encourage you to dig deeper. Um, if you have any questions about medical ethics, feel free to reach out to me. My website is stephenbradleymd.com. Thanks for tuning in to Curbside Ethics. The goal of this podcast is to empower you, the clinician, to provide better ethical and equitable care for the benefit of your patients.